Sam from Sheridan Computers. Going to be taking um, a further look at PFSense. This time we're going to be looking at how to um, set up OpenVPN. So one of the current issues at the moment is the fact that everybody's got to work from home with this COVID-19 issue. Um, PFSense is an open source firewall solution, so it's um, a perfectly acceptable way to give your employees remote access to your office. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you how you can uh, set up OpenVPN, uh, how you can set the clients up on the uh, employee machines, etc. And from there, you should be fully accessible to the inside of your office and your internal office network. So if you like this video, please do take the time to hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. If you hit the notifications icon, you will receive notifications of any new videos as they are released. Also, if you would like to hire us for anything, such as this project, for example, head across to our website at sheridan.co.uk. If you click on the Hire Us button, leave some details on what you're looking for, we'll get back to you. So, let's get started, and we're um, taking off from the fresh install of PFSense that I did on my previous video. So now we're going to have a look at what we need to do to set up OpenVPN. Just move this window out of the way a little bit. Okay, so um, this is basically where I left PFSense on my previous video um, that I did on how to install PFSense. I installed it, set a couple of initial options, um, and we left it here. So this is where I left that video. So to set up uh, OpenVPN, we're going to need to go into the VPNs tab and select OpenVPN. So we've got no servers in here. Um, you can add more than one server. One thing to take note of is if you do add more than one server, they're going to have to listen on um, separate external addresses. You can't have uh, separate external ports. Sorry, you can't have this uh, more than one VPN server listening on one port. Um, that's pretty much common sense, but just to clarify. Uh, so PFSense supports a wizard for setting this up. So we're going to go ahead and use the wizard. It cuts out a few steps, mainly with certificates and things. Um, so we need to select an authentication backend type. We have various options, local user access, which just uses a local database of users. We can use LDAP or Radius. For this purpose, we're going to use local user access. And we're going to click Next. So at this point, the next step is to set up our certificate authority. So we need to set this up. So we'll go ahead and give it a descriptive name. So I'm going to use PFSense CA. You see, I've already typed that in on a previous install somewhere. Um, give it something that you can identify it to. It'll make life easier in the long run. The key length is fine at 2048 bit. Uh, lifetime is set to 3650 by default, so 10 years. Um, should be long enough for us. So we need to put the uh, two-letter ISO country code in. So GB, state or province. So we're going to put Greater Manchester, and then Manchester. The city, and then we're going to put the organization name in. So let's go ahead and create that certificate. Um, so we've created that. So now we need to create a server certificate. So I'm just going to put uh, SCL VPN. Again, we can leave it to 2048 bit. Uh, lifetime is set to 398 days. Um, service, uh, sorry, lifetime in days. The service certificate should not have a lifetime of over 398 days or some platforms will consider them invalid. Uh, so you can set this to whatever you want. So that's a 365. Um, we can leave the rest of the options at default and go ahead and create that certificate. So we've created the certificate for the, uh, the certificate authority and we've created the server certificate itself. So the next thing that we need to do is to actually set up the OpenVPN server. So interface is obviously going to be your WAN interface. So we need to listen for incoming connections on the WAN. Um, not really much point on listening for on the LAN. Protocol. So we can use UDP for uh, so UDP on IPv4, IPv6, uh, TCP, or we can use like multi-homed. Uh, I'm just going to use UDP on IPv4 only. If you're using uh, IPv6, then obviously you're going to want to change them settings. Local port, as I mentioned, you can only have one server listening on one port. So the default is at 1194. Um, we're going to leave that as default. 
Uh, one thing to note here is once you've created the server, you still won't be able to connect unless you uh, open the open the port in the firewall anyway. Um, so you can give it a description. Um, I'm going to leave it for the time being. TLS authentication. Um, they'll let it create the shared key. Uh, DH parameter length. We're going to leave that at uh, group 14, which is 2014 bit. Encryption algorithm. Um, so 128 bit is um, like a standard. Um, it's it's not quite as secure as 256 bit, but it's secure. Um, but it actually runs a lot faster. But we're going to use uh, 256 CBC. Uh, and I want 256 bit SHA256. If your hardware supports um, crypto hardware, then go ahead and select that. It will speed the VPN up by a lot. Um, tunnel network. So it says here, this is a virtual network used for private communications between this server and uh, client host. So if at your office you've got 192.168.1.0 and at home you've got 192.168.0.0, you'd create another one, uh, another network. The default is 10.0.8.0 and that'll act as an intermediary um, subnet between the two. So one thing to be careful of here is if you um, set your tunnel network up to 192.168.0.1, um, it'll cause problems if with a lot of home users and things. Um, the same with local network ranges. It's generally a good idea to avoid using subnets um, that will clash with a lot of uh, home home user routers and things. So 10.0.8.0.24 is fine. I've had no problems using this. Redirect gateway. Um, so if you don't take this, your clients will still be, be able to access the machines on the other side of the network. If you do tick it, then um, all the internet access will also go straight through this gateway. So that's kind of dependent on a use case scenario. Um, I generally do tick this and redirect traffic through it. Um, if people want to use the internet, then they can disconnect from work. Um, it also gives options with DNS later. So your local network, this is 192.168.1.0. 24 is our local network. Um, again, like I said, you should avoid using this for home routers. I've not really got anything connected to this. Um, concurrent connections is the maximum amount of connections that you'd like at any one time. So stick a sensible value in there. Um, compression, if you want to set up compression, you can do this. Uh, if you're going to set compression, I'd leave a legacy style compression on there for older VPN clients. I'm just going to leave that as it is. Um, the type of service, I've never needed to play with this too much. Uh, Inter-client communication. So allow communication between clients connected to this server. So this option here is if you have two laptops um, from home users, if they need to be able to access each other, um, then you want to allow it. Generally, you wouldn't. Um, if you're connecting to an office, then you'd use a server or Office 365, whatever you're using. Um, so I generally... Do not allow communication between clients. You might have a perfectly good reason to do so. Um, duplicate connections allow uh, multiple connections from the same client. Um, it can cause issues and I wouldn't do this if you have somebody that's got a laptop. For example, I have my laptop that has one connection and I have a separate um, connection set up for my phone. So a completely different username for, and password for each device. Dynamic IP allow connected clients to retain their connections if their IP address changes. Um, that's generally a good um, thing to leave ticked because of the uh, disconnect from the internet, reconnect with a different IP address, it'll change the IP address on the VPN. So that's generally a good idea to leave that as it is. Um, subnet. You can assign a slash 30 if you'd want to. You can, I generally just leave this as it is. The default domain is the uh, default DNS domain that you want to um, pass. So if it's, um, you know, like Sheridan.local, if that would be the domain, if, especially if you're on um, Active Directory. Your DNS servers are the DNS servers that you'd like to pass to your clients. So in here, you can put like 
Cloudflare, one dot one dot one dot one. You can use Google eight dot eight dot eight dot eight. Uh, if you're in an, on an Active Directory type of network, then generally you'd want to put the DNS server, the IP address of your DNS server in there, so that it can resolve other clients uh, and devices on the network. Um, you can push an NTP server again if you've got a, a local NTP server. It's a good idea to um, push that as well, so that everything matches up. Um, whether or not you want to enable NetBIOS over TCP, I usually leave that on to make things easier for our clients. Um, and then you can specify Win servers as well. So we'll go ahead and click next to this. So firewall real configuration, open VPN remote access server setup wizard. So we're gonna basically let it create our firewall rules for us. Now, when it does that, keep in mind it's going to allow um, all port, all traffic into um, the port that we defined our server on. Um, so we want to create that, and I also want to create the Open VPN rule as well. This is uh, the benefits of using the wizard is that you don't have to set these up manually. Um, so Open VPN remote access setup wizard is now complete, uh, and we can go ahead and. Um, set our users up. Once we've done that, we can use uh, browse to system packages and install OpenVPN client export. Uh, I did mention this on my previous video and I did install it on the previous video uh, and it's a really handy package to have installed. It just allows you to uh, create the, uh, export the clients very easily, download them onto a laptop or a pen drive or email them or whatever and allow it to set up quite easily. So go ahead and click finish. Um, so as you can see, we've got our interface set up, we've got the protocol port, we've got the tunnel network. Um, it just shows an overview of it. And if you want to go in and edit these for any reason. Um, and we can go in and change our settings. We can disable the server and we can basically adjust any of the settings that we've just made. And you can see our certificates are generated here. Um, Just have a look if there's anything that we need to change in here. No, it's pretty much picked everything up for us. Um, so if you do make any mistakes and you need to make any changes and you can do that. Um, block outside DNS. This is generally a good thing to do, especially in the um, if you're forcing traffic through the gateway, you can block um, access to other DNS servers. So it forces the DNS through the gateway and over the VPN. So if you do that uh, in an Active Directory environment, um, that way you make sure that the DNS is actually querying your DNS servers. We can do a forced DNS cache update, um, which is generally good on Windows 10 machines. So it will clear the DNS cache before it connects to the VPN, so it addresses resolve correctly. Um, if you want to provide a list of NTP servers to the clients, that's fine. Uh, and you can stick in any open VPN pass-through rules you can put in here if you need to get a bit more advanced with it. Uh, and gateway creation, um, I did set it up on IV. It's set to both, but um, even though we're only using IPv4, it's fine on both. Um, That's it. So now we can go ahead and look at creating users. So now let's take a look at uh, creating a user. So we're going to create a user to allow them to uh, connect. So if we go into user manager and add a new user. So let's give this a username. Um, this also gives you the option to, um, you can edit these later and you can go back in and like disable users from being able to log in, um, which is really handy. And you're gonna wanna give it a um, password. So if you go ahead and stick a password in there, obviously give it the user's name, expiration date. So if you want it to expire, so they can't log in after a certain date, you can go ahead and do that. Um, custom settings, you don't need to worry about that too much. Group membership, um, you not really got a need to add them into admins. Um, certificate, 
let's go ahead and create it. So for our descriptive name, I'm going to um, basically give that the same name as the user. Um, and then we can go ahead, that's pretty much it to create a user. So now I'm created as a user, as you can see. Um, okay, so how do I now go ahead about configuring the endpoint to connect? Whether it be a laptop, a desktop, whatever it is. Um, well, this is where I mentioned if you go into Package Manager, and ensure you have OpenVPN client export installed. This is uh, just makes life so much easier. So then when we actually want to set up a VPN for a user, we literally just need to go into VPN, open VPN. Uh, and if we go into clients, sorry, client export, um, we can literally scroll straight down to the bottom and my user exists here. Um, we've got various export options. So most clients will export an OpenVPN configuration file, which you can import into OpenVPN. Um, if you set up a phone, whichever, you can do it that way. Um, if you're using Windows, then there's a bundle here. So part of the export client package uh, exports the OpenVPN client as well. Um, so we click that and it'll download the full install and install OpenVPN, it'll install the um, it'll install the package, it'll install the configuration files and it'll set it all up for you. Um, and it's just a really quick and easy way to set these things up. So if we go ahead and download that. We'll go ahead and save it. Um, So it's a Windows 10 executable. Let me go ahead and save that file. Um, okay, so in order to do this, I need to switch to a Windows machine. And I'll go through the install of uh, how to do it on a Windows machine. You won't actually install on this because it's uh, Linux. So I'll bear with me one second while I switch machines. Okay, we're back on Windows and I've got my configuration file here. So we're going to go ahead and run that. We'll get UAC pop up asking you to allow permission to so go ahead and do it. Um, and then we get the OpenVPN installer. Click install. And drag this back over here. Um, click next through the options. Let me go ahead and install. I want to show the readme. And now we have OpenVPN installed. So we've run OpenVPN and the icons here. I'll just pause the video there while I drag the taskbar over here so you can see what I'm doing. So if we right click it, right click it, sorry, and do connect. Um we drag these across. So this is what we get. So we'll put in our username that we specified, and then the password, if you can remember what it was. Save the password and then we can go ahead and try and connect. So now we're um, connected. Um, we drop to a command prompt real quick. So um, now I should be able to ping the gateway on the other side of the VPN. And there it is. Um, if I find the IP address of the machine that I set it up on. 192.168.1.101. And as you can see, I can um, I'll ping my Kali machine as well. Um, that's basically pretty much all you need to do to get OpenVPN to run. It is quite easy to set up. 
Um, and we offer it as a service. So like I said at the beginning of this video, if you um, liked it and you found this video helpful and um, you made use of made use of it and you had to manage to set VPNs up and stuff with it, please take the time to hit the like button. It does take um, some time to do these videos. And if you sub consider subscribing to the channel, you will receive notifications of any videos I ever do. Um, that's about it for as far as I go. If you'd like to hire us, please head across to our website at sheridan.co.uk. Uh, click on the Hyros link and follow it through from there. Thank you.